Hello and welcome to Thinking Outside the Box with me, Tim Box. And me, Britt Box. We talk about all things mental health, emotional well-being and how to navigate your own mind in these strange times. We'll do our usual disclaimer, of course, please do not confuse any of our advice for medical advice because neither of us are doctors. We try and bring a certain light-hearted approach to the topics that we talk about, but please don't think we are trivialising them. We do take them seriously, but we maybe come at it from a slightly different angle. Hence, thinking outside the box. Okay, it's episode five, Brit. Wow, where has that gone? Amazing. <laughs> We've motored on to episode five, which uh, if Star Wars is anything to go by, this should be the best one. Look, we had a Star Wars reference at the start of the last episode. We can't keep doing this. I think we absolutely can, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so this episode is, well, episode three, we spoke about your journey. Yes. Um, in particular, talking about depression. Yes. And episode five, we're talking about my journey, and in particular, talking about anxiety. Yeah, we thought it would be helpful to kind of show you all why we think we're the people to do this podcast, really. I suppose, yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it, to tell people what we've been through and what, I don't know, what we've learned. In, in our yeah absolutely years. absolutely because I think as much as you come from you come from the professional kind of angle when we talk about mental health I think it's important to note that you know I have my struggles with depression and other things and and you had certainly a very big struggle with anxiety and I I thought it was really imperative that we talked about this I remember when I said I want to tell my story and I think you should tell yours mm. and I remember at the start you were a little bit reluctant to but I think it will I think it will help a lot of people well, this is the thing. When when we did yours, we did a little content warning at the start, didn't we? For what we might talk about. Talk about. Yes. Uh, there is no such content warning in this one. Rather than hearing a story of um, years of trauma, you're going to hear a story of not a lot happening, really, <laughs> um, but me getting tremendously anxious about certain aspects of my life. Um, so I probably should say right away, I'm not putting myself up here as any sort of pariah in terms of what I've been through. I'm, I'm well aware that my, my existence has been, by comparison, fairly sheltered. Mm. Um, and you could argue that may be one of the reasons why I dealt with quite a bit of anxiety because I haven't necessarily learnt, oh, I can handle adversity. Mm. So when any adversity came my way, maybe I felt a little bit more vulnerable than, than perhaps you might have done in those circumstances, I don't know. But um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not, this is not an attempt to be an oh woe is me, but I'm well aware these days, now I understand this topic a little bit better than as I was growing up. Um, yeah, I went through a fair amount of, of high anxiety, as I would call it, and I did in some way get the other side of the worst parts of it. So whilst I still feel anxious, I no longer suffer with anxiety, is, is kind of the way I define it. Hmm. Um, take but, us, take us to the beginning, Tim. Take us from the ah, start. Ah, we go. This is where it goes all misty. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, right. The, well, this is really interesting because I don't tend to think about the beginning because I, I talk about. I, I'm aware of a, a time in my life when I I had a tremendous amount of what you know what experts would call social anxiety, but yeah, the beginning is me being a nervous kid. Mm. I think um, I was the youngest of of uh, myself and my sister, and. I'm, when you asked me to think about this, I'm like, yeah, I, I remember I used to feel very protected mm. by Mandy, my sister. Um, she was two years older than me and she certainly sheltered me in my advancement into like primary school when I went from infants to junior school. Did you go to the same schools? We did, yeah, because we were in a mixed school, Horsted. Shout out to all the Horsted crew that might be listening to this. <laughs> if <laughs> and, any of and, them are. Well, to be fair, anyone that's from Horsted that's listening to this may well have the opinion of me, yeah, didn't Tim cry a lot when he was younger? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm, not laugh I'm not laughing yeah. at that. Just... <laughs> and gen generally, um, yeah, struggle with life in general, I think, was, was how I remember it. I think, there was, obviously, it wasn't, I had, I had a fairly good upbringing, a fairly, a fairly sheltered childhood, but <laughs> I am, I'm well aware that I was slightly um, quick to, to, to hit the tears, I think. Um, yeah. But, you know, I don't think I necessarily went through anything that may have triggered higher levels of anxiety. I know my mum is quite a worrier, you mm. know, because um, I'm always, the person I am these days, well, these days, I, I like to think about cause and effect. And I'm always thinking, what, what do we think it was that caused me to feel quite so anxious then later on mm. um, in, in my upbringing? Um, and I, I guess I've got nothing really to pin it on uh, categorically. Well, there was the mirror maze incident. 
oh, the mirror maze incident. Oh, thanks for re-traumatising me with that, Brit. Appreciate that. But well, I'm going to have to explain it now, aren't I? Yeah, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to send this bit to Mandy. So. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, a great memory for Mandy. She, she loves it. So when we were younger, we used to go to Dimchurch, which is uh, on the coast of uh, the south of England. And um, there's a little place called St. Mary's Bay, which even after the Mirror Maze incident, I still regard as one of my happy places mm. in life. We go it's, there regularly. Yeah, it's lovely. It's just the beach and, you know, it's, and there's a little fairground there. And at some point when I was younger, I mean, I, I think I was about, I don't know, five or six, but I may well have been in my teens for all I know. <laughs> you were actually 27. Yeah. <laughs> We went in this, um, the mirror maze, but it's like, it's just a load of glass panels. There's no actual mirrors in no, mirror there. No, there isn't. There is. I think there might be the odd one, but right. mostly you, you, I mean, you're not bumping into mirrors, are you? No, you're you, not you can see it's yourself. It's like, a, it's like a confused conservatory. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> <laughs> confused conservatory, band name yeah, there. there you go. Um, anyway, but so, yeah, and I, we, we were in there and I just had a, oh, I had a bad time in the mirror <laughs> maze. <laughs> Were you like a parrot, just pecking at your own I, reflection? No, it wasn't no, quite canary, that bad. It? it wasn't that bad. I mean, I could, I recognised that my reflection wasn't another person trying to hurt me. <laughs> but I just kept bouncing off the glass. That's all I can... I just remember trying to walk through it and at some point deciding, no, nah, I've had enough, and just stopping there and crying. Oh, babe. And then, because you can see... The thing about a mirror maze, where it's just glass, mm. you can see everyone outside watching you in the maze. Um, and... They, they were finding it quite amusing, <laughs> this little boy bouncing off the windows. And um, I don't know, I, I don't remember them looking and at And your sister him. left you there, if I, if I remember rightly. Yeah, she buggered off. She, she was left gone. You, she yeah. was gone. She, was, she did come back for me, though. But I think it was only because mum and dad said, oh, go and get your brother. He'll never get out of there on his own. And, um, and then we did a mirror maze and I left you in there. Yeah, just to, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether this is something you uh, want our listeners to hear. Because uh, it makes you sound quite callous. Oh, and, uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, so anyway, I, I burst it, I cried and it traumatised no. me. I say it traumatised me. I mean, it was, uh, it took me a while to pluck up the courage to go back in. But I was, <laughs> it was, you know why, what gave me the courage to go back in all those years later? Because I had you by my side and I knew you wouldn't just run off. Oh, no, wait a minute, there you did. <laughs> run off and left me. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, is this anyway. actually where we're starting with my anxiety story? Yes. Is the mirror maze. The mirror maze. At, at St Mary's Bay in Dimchurch. Absolutely. Okay, well, that's, I feel I've, I've shared something there and I feel well, like I've got Thanks for listening, through, everyone. That's yeah, the end is, of Anyway, right. So yeah. So the the, yeah, the the summary of that sequence of the podcast is yeah, nervous Tim when he was younger. Um, but I'm not. I'm, I wouldn't put anything. Any. I wouldn't put any real cause and effect on things. I just was a, was a nervous kid, I suppose. Mm. Um, it wasn't really until I got to secondary school. I remember I found secondary school difficult compared to my primary school. I think it might have been because I went to a grammar school. So whereas in my primary school, I was like near the top of the class in terms of my academically. Yeah. But when I got to grammar school, I wasn't I wasn't anything special because it was all of the top kids in, in the region. And I was I was fairly average and, and not so good in other areas. Mm. Um, and I don't know, I, I remember struggling and it wasn't really until about the fifth form or what we then oh, I say fifth form I'm using old old money here aren't I? I don't know what year that is in well it, when I was when I was there so the year before sixth form yes that's right. right so that was year year 10 year no 10. year 11 for me I think yes it was year 11 but I think it even has a different name now oh god I think year 11 is obsolete so okay. anyway well, I feel so old I, me too you. it's all right so so before you were allowed to wear your own clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. A year before that's, you were allowed yes, to wear your own clothes. It. Before we got a different... No, at my school, you weren't allowed to wear your own clothes. Oh. You just got a different tie. Oh, okay. To, well, the year before your different tie. Yeah, the year before my different tie. That was when it kind of started. And in the sixth form there, it was basically that time when you go from being a teenager to being an adult, I suppose. That, that sort adult, of time. Yeah. And this all continued. The high levels of anxiety, I felt I had massive social anxiety. And I just felt like I didn't fit in at all. Mm. And I, I, I don't know, around that time, you know, you have your social circle, your friends, your people that you hang out with. Yeah. And I was doing, I kept, I seemingly kept transitioning between social circles. Like I couldn't quite find the place I wanted to be. Mm. I think I really wanted to be like one of the cool alternative kids, <laughs> but never really graduated beyond the lot that played Dungeons and Dragons, if you know what I mean. Hey, they're so, the cool kids in my opinion. Well, I think retrospectively, thanks to Stranger Things, mm. yeah, we were the cool, but I didn't really know that then that we were the cool kids. Wow. Um, but so there was, and there was just a lot of anxiety about going into social situations, mm. going into a room of people. And it all culminated with um, 
what happened was I think it was lower sixth or or, or late fifth form. Um, we were starting to discover music, and I was starting to play guitar a little bit, and I really liked the idea of being in a band. And the people who were in my year found that idea hilarious. You know, it was, oh, it was don't, like, don't, don't get me started with this. I mean, we like we said with with yeah. with my story that I went to theatre school and I was a singer as a kid. It just seems to be if you have anything mm. that makes you shine, other kids try yeah. and drag you down. And as my mum would say, it was just jealousy. Well, this is well, I don't, I don't know. I, I can't even look at it in that way because mm. it was just I was aware that, and this felt very familiar to me. An mm. attempt to do something different, or to even just to fit in with the people that were doing that. You know, yeah. that was the group that I wanted to be a part of, and just getting ridiculed for it. Um, and at one point, um, teenagers I just, are the worst. The the thing that I remember is I just got something stuck on my back. Yeah. Somebody, one of my, the person I consider one of my best friends actually at the time, mm. stuck something on my back, and I just ended up walking around. Two lessons. I walked from lesson to there. Lesson to there. I was at the front of the class with both of them. Everyone laughing at me behind my back. I didn't realise until we got out in the corridor, like for break oh. or lunch or whatever it was. And it was just, you know, you see in the films mm. when people are getting laughed at, yeah, and or like, and, and it's in a dream and everyone's laughing at them. And it's got this fisheye lens and everyone's yes. pointing and laughing yeah, yeah. really maniacally. That's how I remember it. It oh. was the entire year that we're just crammed into this corridor. It seemed to me. Anyway. That's awful. Um, and it, well, it was it was quite harrowing at the time. Yeah, no, I bet. And it, it did make me question whether anyone actually gave a, a stuff about me at all. Yeah. And and it was one of those things that you look back on it now and you think, well, that's nothing, is it? But it seemed like it at the time. No, yeah? it doesn't seem nothing to me. Yeah, I'm thinking this is. I can tell you're doing the you love me kind of caring thing. But at the, at the time, I, I feel I know people have been through shit. Am I bleeping that out now? Is that the first time we've sworn on the podcast? I knew it would be you. I knew it would be me as well. I knew it would be this one as well. I know people have been through stuff, yeah? And I'm not saying, oh, this was so, this was a really heavy thing. Mm. But what I am saying, all of this stuff, it it kind of bit by bit by bit by bit added up to me feeling incredibly uncomfortable around people. Well, things are relative, like we've said before. Well, the funny thing is, like, if I probably, I think, what? how old am I now? uh, probably I think for the next five or six years at least, mm. probably more like 10 years, if I walked past a group of people, even a small group of people, mm. and one of them laughed at something that they were talking about, I instinctively ran one of my hands up my back oh. just to check there was nothing on my back. It yeah. wasn't like, I wonder if, you know, but it just became that, yeah. that kind of reflex action. And and it was one of the, so it kind of stayed with me, that experience. Um, and then I, and I could give you loads of experiences then of going into situations events where I had to be around a lot of people and it just became to the point where it was it was quite debilitating at times the the thought of how am I going to deal with this particular social situation Mm. and the funny thing was I didn't necessarily think there was anything wrong with me yeah I wasn't thinking oh no this is I'm, I'm ill or anything I just thought I was rubbish you know, I thought I can't handle what other people can handle easily. Yeah. So it wasn't like I'd ever frame myself as, oh, I have anxiety now. Because mm. I've got to be honest with you, I didn't really start to understand the term anxiety until I started to study, you know, therapy and stuff like that and, and actually study the mind. Yeah. The word anxiety wasn't necessarily in my vocabulary at this time. It could be argued as well that that's because this was the 80s. Yeah, this is, I think, different times. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I don't, you know, if you went to the doctor with what we would recognise as anxiety now, they would say nerves or worrying yes. or stress or yeah. things like that. They wouldn't be using that, that those terminology. So I think, yeah, that's probably one of the reasons why I wasn't actually, you know, I wouldn't just say, oh, I have anxiety or something like that. But um, I just, I was just aware that I thought, even though I feel it and I don't think other people do in the same way, I don't think that's because I'm ill. I think that's because I'm just not very good. I'm mm. just I'm just useless at handling these situations, which I'll come back to in a, in a minute. But I think that was a good thing. Okay. I, I don't know. I think that was good that I didn't, that I was, I just judged myself, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But I'll come back to that. Um, so late around this time, I said I was getting into music. I wanted to be in a band. And it's this really weird thing where... I was really looking forward to standing up in front of everyone and performing, but that's because I was just thrashing a guitar with lots of noise. Mm. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't a cultured musician, I should say that now. And I, in fact, I wouldn't call myself a musician. I knew some chords and um, I could shout a bit over the top of it, yeah. But as soon as the music stops, I would not speak into the microphone. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I, I was, so I, I, people would say, oh, you were, you were really confident because you were in a band. Mm. No, no, not at all. And it's funny how many people I've been in bands with over the years 
who are tremendously socially anxious. Did you find in a way that it was almost like taking on a different persona? Yeah. Because I know that's what a lot of people who are in bands or who play instruments or who perform, uh, who maybe weren't as confident, they saw it as, you know, when I'm this person, it's Mm. easier than when I'm just plain old me. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right there. Certainly the later years of me being in a band I was very aware it wasn't it wasn't me when I'm on stage or certain, yeah. or it was maybe the me that I thought I could be if mm. you know what I mean it wasn't but the funny thing was I remember that first the first gig I ever did was a school gig as well mm. which was really I felt so much pressure because we were meant to perform and I, and I suddenly was gripped with that dawning realization oh hang on I've got to stand up in front of all these people <laughs> that bully me yeah and then perform yeah and it felt I mean I, I was absolutely adamant I'm not going to do it because we were, it's this really weird situation. We were on third out of four bands. And I watched the first band go, I was backstage with the first band and they walked on stage and I suddenly became absolutely um, irrefutably aware I can't do that. Mm. So, because as they walked out, I was just aware, I, if that was me now, I wouldn't be able to go out there. Right. And so I was having this sort of existential crisis as the other bands were playing. <laughs> and it was just, it was fortunate. But you know when you think about one of those moments where, you learn something mm. and it changes the way you look at something right mm. i had one of those moments fortunately because i was in the audience for the second band and the drummer of the second band was uh, really close mate funnily enough he was also the guitarist in my band so he's oh he's okay yeah he's a most talented guy um a good friend of mine called daryl amazing amazing guy i just haven't seen him in years actually i'd love to catch up with him anyway um and and he he was drumming for the for the band before us. Mm. And there's a bit in the song. It was actually uh, "Grooves in the Heart" by D uh, D Light. Yes, that was the song they were covering. And there's a bit where the drums stop and right. then they start again. And he stopped the drums and he stood up and sort of held his arms in the air. And I suddenly thought, hang on, he's really enjoying himself. <laughs> he's having fun. <laughs> and I, I was like, that's a strange idea, isn't it? And then I suddenly. <laughs> was open to the concept that maybe this would be fun and enjoyable yeah. and, and that I sort of ran with that and that's what to made feel me the do nerves it. as excitement yeah well exactly it's that thing isn't it where you excitement and fear feel viscerally very similar mm. and and that's why you know when I don't know if we think we're being followed that feeling is terror mm. if we're I don't know queuing up for a roller coaster mm. it's excitement you know it's, it's that what's the what's the context here so I think I'll tell you that when we're queuing up next for Tower of Terror and you're telling me how much you don't want to do it. No, that is terror. That is, <laughs> that is, that that is, is fear. Yeah, that is knowing I'm not going to have a good time. Right now. Um, but no, so that sort of thing. And it was just, I don't know, just you get to reframe something. Yeah. But I digress anyway. But even even then, you know, there was there was loads of things that were going on. So two, two more instances that I remember social anxiety just rearing up. Mm. One of them was the first hypnosis training I ever went on. It was a weekend course. Just bef- before we met, isn't it? Bef- yeah, long yeah. before we met. Yeah, and, and I remember um, we, it was in a hotel in, uh, up by, the, by Heathrow Airport. And my room, coincidentally, was within eyeline of the little reception area where we were all meeting for coffees. And I kept poking my head out of the room and I could see there were still people there having a coffee chatting. And I put my head back in. And I kept poking my head out and like still people were there. And it wasn't until there was nobody there mm. and I could just walk up to the desk and pick my badge up and walk in and just join the, the, the seated people listening to the lectures and stuff. Only then did I actually go down there and, um, and actually do that. Mm. And, and it just, it became, I became very aware that, oh yeah, that's what I do, isn't it? I just avoid these situations. Mm. And it's funny, these days I talk to people about how much energy we put into avoiding the challenging situations rather than putting the energy into overcoming what we feel is challenging about them. Yes. Yeah. And I was just doing that. I, I was just kind of avoiding situations. And um, the second one was, you know, that, I, that springs to mind as I, as I was tell this story kind of thing, was my first time networking. And, and this wasn't long before we met. This is when I was in my 30s, yeah. you know, mid-30s, I think. Um, and... Hang on. Networking is also just people standing around talking with coffee. Is it maybe... Mm just the open networking aspect. I tell you what, talking, chatting to people in a group situation, it absolutely was. Now, I know obviously this is going to be a long tail that you'll eventually come to the end of, but I... <laughs> like all of my stories. <laughs> like all of your stories. <laughs> you, there was a but... faint sort of boredom element in what you just said there. But I know when I think of things like 
open networking, which is what I would call that. People yeah. standing around, small talk, tiny talk with coffees, you tiny know, talk. tiny talk. I, in my head, I hate it. And you are so much better at it than me. In fact, I'm the person now that will like be outside the room and I will watch you talk to people. So, yeah. I, you know, even though I know where this story is going, yeah, yeah. I find it really interesting that, that you that you really didn't like that. When I think yeah. now you're one of the best people I know at that sort of thing. Do you know what? This is, this is, that's a really good observation because the number of times people who have been afraid of something in, in my, in, when I've been working with them, have discovered, oh, I'm quite good at it, actually, <laughs> you know. And I think I yeah. am I am quite good at chatting with people because mm. I actually enjoy getting to know people, which I think is what makes you good at it, you know. Mm. But I was so fixated on the idea that they would reject me or laugh at me mm. or feel like I wasn't intelligent or cool enough, basically. Let's go back to what it was. I, I wasn't it was playground, cool enough. playground fears. It was it? playground fears, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it took me a while to realise, oh, no, hang on, when you're networking now in this context – you can just walk up to people and say, hi, I'm Tim. Also, what do you do? Because everyone is feeling the same way. We all just yeah. hide it in varying degrees. Yeah, yeah. But this is the thing. If I, if I did what I would normally do, mm. which was go, go somewhere and, and get, go to the coffee machine and, and sort of look really intently at my coffee or, <laughs> you know, I would, I would think, I, would, you know, I don't know, you'd, you'd look at your phone now, don't you? If you yes. By the way, if you want to find the socially anxious person in the room, yes. it's the person who's leaning against the wall checking their phone and looking at it as if something really important's just come in. I because gen- then people won't come up to them and disturb them. <laughs> Genuinely, yeah. I've done this and I spent 10 minutes, and I'm not even exaggerating, looking at the calculator <laughs> because I, I had no internet signal, so I yes. couldn't scroll anything, I couldn't do anything. I just added up numbers yeah. on the calculator. I, yeah, I got very good at, at feigning really intense interest <laughs> in things that were either not happening at all yeah. or really weren't that interesting. Or I'd, I'd suddenly think, oh, I've got to go and do that thing at the, with my car. Go and check. But have I left that in the car? Yeah. It's like, what? What are you going for? Don't don't question me, please, because I haven't thought of that far through. You know? and, and things like that. And it's mm. just, I don't know. It just, I think, I think what it was, like you say, it was playground stuff. Yeah. It was me thinking they're going to realise I'm not that cool mm. and then they're going to either kick me out or laugh at me yeah. and all of those old experiences. Judgment. You know, judgment. Yeah, it was judgment. Fear of judgment. And uh, that was what drove it for me. And mm. um, I don't know, That that's kind of... I, I lived with that long enough for it to be just, as far as I was concerned, that's just how I am. Mm. And it wasn't necessarily something that I started to recognise I could change until I started changing it, yeah. you know, and, and again, you talk about, um, you talk about a moment where I have a couple of moments in my, my kind of development that I remember thinking, huh, that's interesting. That actually challenges my perception of who I am mm. in a good way. Mm. So the first one was when um, I was younger and my mum and dad used to throw an annual fireworks party that used to be notoriously dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> they, m- my dad, for some reason, the most careful man on the planet, and suddenly around fireworks night became some sort of Mephistopheles character running around with, with like he became the rocket. embodiment of Guy Fawkes. Well, himself. he was, yeah. He just he literally, you know, he would cut the 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 sticks off of the rockets that are meant to stabilise them, so they go up in the air rather Bloody than hell. just fly around the the garden. Um, he he. I can only imagine what this did to your mother. <laughs> he created he would create a fire every year that was mm. so large. We used to have to like keep the hose pipe handy just in case the trees caught on fire. And <laughs> um, so, but anyway, there was it was just one of those years. I don't remember who I was talking to, and I don't remember what we were talking about. But the next day, my dad came up to me and said, "Oh, I was chatting with you know, it was mum and dad's friends. Basically, it wasn't. Mm. It was you know, they weren't they weren't any my age there. No. It was all my family and their friends and things like that. And I'd been chatting with some of my dad's friends, and um, he said they were." They were so impressed by you last night. Aww. And I was like, what do you mean? And they said, well, it's so rare to meet somebody. They said it was so rare to meet somebody of your age who can actually hold a conversation rather than just sort of standing in the corner and things like that. And I thought, oh, blimey, how many baby shams did I have last night? <laughs> <laughs> baby <laughs> well, sham. That, I feel like that was my drink of choice around that age. Fabulous. Um, but, but it was that moment where I thought, oh, actually, maybe... Maybe I am interesting, mm. you know, and, and okay, it wasn't like I was hanging out with the cool set, you know, with my parents' friends, but it just made me think maybe I actually can hold a conversation yeah. and I can hold an intelligent conversation as well. 
And and the second thing that, that I remember this helped me, this educated me a little bit, was when I was, um, it was later on, it was more recent, it was like in the last 10 years, where um, I was networking and I was a member of a group where I was, so I, I network at, at BNI, if anyone's heard of that, and we have... Not an ad. We have, <laughs> we do... Uh, we do we have roles like we look after groups or we you know and I, I sort of took a role on looking after some of the other chapters and then we had this big annual training where we you know we, we addressed like 300 400 people um, and because when we're networking we do a 60 second presentation all of us every single person in the room says this is my business this is the referrals I'm looking for mm -hmm. and so I've been doing that for, for a fair amount of time funnily enough that didn't scare me quite as much as talking to people do. Well, I think that's because what I, uh, the thing I would recognise about that is you have 60 seconds to talk. Yeah. No one's replying to you. No one's challenging you, which is why on days when I don't want to talk to anyone, I'm yeah. happy to do my Instagram stories because yeah. it's just me projecting. And I feel that's what a 60 second is. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying, actually. Funny enough, though, I remember the first one I did and um, there's me as a hypnotherapist standing up. I can help you with self-esteem and confidence. And, <laughs> and I, you know, I was doing that Was thing. this before, before your voice dropped? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah um, well, to be fair, this is how I remember it. Though. You know, when you do that thing of um, when you... <laughs> yeah, that yeah. sort of breathing thing. Yeah, I was doing that and I could feel my voice wobbling. That's, that's what I mean. And um, anyway, yeah, but that's it. But so this, the story I'm telling, though, was, was when um, this was like, a, this was a year or two into my networking. So I was kind of happy to do I would still sit down and my hands would be shaking yeah I was still aware of that and I was still wondering if I'll ever get over that little did I know then that's simply an, an adrenaline reaction you know you yeah. feel with adrenaline to do something important and then you it's tr adrenaline's trying to get you to run around the room or do something of action yeah when you don't you shake because you're yeah. simple as that so it didn't it doesn't bother me now you know yeah. but the lady um good friend of mine Jill Russell spoke to her the other day awesome lady she was in charge of all of us and she said, right, this next, the bit here is a really important bit of presenting. So I need, I need my top presenter doing this bit. Tim, are you okay to do this? <laughs> and I was like looking around, what, well, me? And, and you know when you're like somebody... And then who, another guy called Tim was like, no, just Yeah, that's it. No, honestly, it was that moment where you think, oh, somebody believes in me more than I believe in me. And you either take that and you reject it, mm. or you take it and you say, okay, maybe I'll, I'll take their word for this then that they, they want me to do this, not because they're pandering to the anxious person in the room, mm. but maybe because they believe that I'd be the best person to do the job. Mm. And so things like that, yeah. And and this is the thing, I guess I'm trying to move it on to what did I do to change things? Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's one thing saying I experienced this, but I had somebody ask me the other day, so did you use hypnosis to get, because for those of you who don't know, remedial hypnotism, hypnotherapy, if you like, that's what I do. Mm. Um, and no, I didn't. Because I'm one of those people that, that don't, I was not a great responder to hypnosis. I'm perfectly good hypnotizing people, but I'm not a great responder to it. Mm. Um, but I did change and I did get the other side of that phase of my life. And like I said at the start, I might feel anxious at times. It's not because I'm broken, it's because I'm human, mm. but I don't suffer with anxiety. And as I was saying, the big thing that enabled me to change, I was never diagnosed with anxiety. Yeah. So I never walked around with the framework that I just have anxiety now. Mm. And it wasn't as if there was anything that I felt was broken or malfunctioning about me. Um, and so it enabled me to do what hopefully we should be able to do, which is learn and grow and become better with experience, if yeah. that makes sense. So, so there wasn't any diagnosis <clears throat> that was locking me into the way I felt. Mm. I think that was, that was a big deal for me. Um, and, and I think that enabled me to, to make some change, which is why I'm often talking about the often negative aspects of being told you have anxiety now. You know, mm. it's like you go you go to a doctor because you're feeling viscerally, you know, really quite dodgy in these situations, and the doctor will do all those medical tests mm. and he'll check for a medical problem. And then if because anxiety is a diagnosis of exclusion, you know, when we rule everything out, then oh, this must be an anxiety response. Yeah. And then, of course, we, we sometimes can make the mistake of thinking I've been diagnosed with anxiety yeah. rather than the doctor's given me the all clear and just let me know that, right, I need to sort the emotional conflict out. I, yeah. need, to, I need to sort the subconscious confusion out rather than there's any medical problem I need to concern myself with. 
because you do hear people saying, I want to get rid of my anxiety. But obviously, anxiety is an emotion that we all need, isn't it? Well, exactly. I, I hear that all the time. But if, if you didn't feel anxious, you would be the one person on the planet that doesn't feel anxious on mm. a daily basis. This is a, a human response. Every emotion serves a purpose. Yeah. And, you know, I, I talk about this on, on my TED talk, which, you know, which I, I went on to do at a later stage in my life. You know, it's like there's every emotion has has a purpose in terms of steering us towards ultimately some form of happiness in yeah. some way so if we <clears> feel <throat> fear it's because we perceive there to be something dangerous up ahead and yeah. so that discomfort that we feel encourages us to move away from the thing that's causing it so yeah. we we stay safe kind of thing if um if somebody wrongs us we might uh, get angry and it's it's a bit of our mind saying i'm going to give you the emotional response now that will encourage you to right the wrong mm. okay so and anxiety is no different than any other emotion. It's no more sinister. It's no more negative in its intent. In fact, it's got positive intent. Anxiety is a bit of your mind saying, pay attention to this important thing. Mm. And that's why it can be so persistent and insistent, is that your, a bit of your mind says, this is the most important thing right now. I need you to focus on it. What would you say, though, to people who would have it in excess? So being anxious is the only thing they can think about. What tends to happen is that we feel anxious about all sorts of things. Mm. So my, my thing was social situations, but there's a lot of people that feel a great deal of anxiety about, I don't know, the global pandemic. Yeah, about, it's like, why do I feel anxious, she said, a year into a pandemic. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and I think this is, this is the thing, that there's always something, yeah? Mm. And the problem is, if we feel anxious about something that we can't do anything about, you've got a bit of your mind trying to inspire you to take action on something that you can't take action on yeah which is which when you think about it there's a lot of stuff you know ultimately um social anxiety it's of the judgment of others that is concerning me you I can't, can't control i can't control that yeah. i can't do anything about that so it just sits there you know um what i could do of course was avoid those situations which was yeah. the only action really i could take but what if we're anxious about something we can't avoid like our health or you know this situation with lockdown and our job or our career or our finances yeah the things that maybe we don't actually get to take action on immediately yeah. there's always that thing where because after all things like finances and career they can be ongoing can't they? they don't just easily get changed yes so what happens then you've got a bit of you trying to get you to take action on something where you can't actually answer that call directly mm. Sometimes it will start to, it will feel like it has to shout louder at you to be heard. So you said that, that not being diagnosed was one of the things that you found helped you. How, mm. how did you get from not wanting to, to go walk into a room where people were open networking to being able to stand on stage and give a TED talk? Okay, so the thing, the thing I, I would say um, is that I, I wasn't diagnosed, but I, I didn't realise going to the doctor was an option. Yeah. Fortunately for me, I had no idea that that was something I could do or something I, I might want to do. So I didn't. That's how I ended up not getting diagnosed. And to be fair, would I have been diagnosed? I don't know because I'm not a doctor. So I can't tell you if that would have warranted a diagnosis. But where I, how I got from where I was to where I am now, I think there's a bit of me that is quite, quite the critical thinker. And what I mean by that is I studied philosophy at university and philosophy teaches you you know, it teaches you some good things to talk about in the pub to make people think you're interesting, <laughs> but also it teaches you not to make assumptions. And so I thought, right, hang on then. What am I anxious about? Yeah, I started to, what's the, and, and if I assume that it's not because I'm broken that I'm anxious, it's because my mind is, is having excessive concern about something that I don't think is warranted. Yeah. So my whole thing was judgment of others. Mm. Okay. Now, there was a time when the judgment of others was legitimately and justifiably the most important concern for me because I was at school. Yeah. Yeah. When we're at school, we get put in a room with what, 25, 30 people. And they say, right, you're going to be with these people now for the next few years. So probably best you find your allies and work out who your enemies are. Absolutely. This is this is one of the reasons why I think that, you know, just a just a slight, slight off topic that mm. people feel guilty about staying friends with their school friends because they've known them for so long and I'm very much of the opinion of would I be friends with this person now if I met them as an adult exactly and if the answer is no then you have no guilt there yeah. to to not talk to someone who knew you in a certain way yeah yes yeah, so you've got no duty to anyone because yeah. a lot of the time you know they they didn't choose to be friends with you you didn't choose to be friends with them you were yeah. just in that room together some people meet friends for life from school uh, and absolutely that's, yeah and that's amazing that but you know there are people as well that and you find that some people now as adults 
are stuck in their school years. Yes. That yeah. for them, the school years was the best year of their life, which I can't relate to <laughs> at all. Um, and so, and so they they're stuck in that. So you yeah. know, they they are that way. Whereas I, I I very seldom I don't speak to pretty much nearly anyone. I maybe a handful of people that I went to school yeah, with that I consider yeah. to be actual friends. And in fact, one of my close friends I went to school with, but we weren't close at school. Kira. <laughs> He seems to be getting a mention every episode. So. That's, our, that's our weekly mention of Kira. That's our one per list. Nice one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but this is the thing. So in that situation, mm. and, and social acceptance becomes your paramount concern. Yeah, so this is why we start, you know, we start smoking in our teenage years because it's more important to fit in with the cool kids mm. than it is to guard our health mm. and not do ourselves damage health. And drink you know. WKD blue in the Well, exactly. <laughs> we do loads of things that are bad for our health because that's not of paramount importance for us. You know, we're going to live forever when we're a teenager, yeah? yeah? But our social circle, that has to be protected. Absolutely. That has to be looked after. I can remember one girl told me if I didn't shoplift with her that she would tell everyone at school something that wasn't true and make sure that nobody ever spoke to me ever again. Uh, is that why you're constantly stealing now? <laughs> <laughs> That's libelous. I am I mean, not a thief. I, I retract that statement uh, for legal thief. reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe the odd grape in a supermarket before before Rona, obviously. That's not, not stealing. <laughs> I mean, I'm buying the grapes anyway. <laughs> That's grape tax. <laughs> anyway, before we get you in trouble. Um, yeah, so, but obviously then I had to recognise that in my adult years, if I don't get on with the people in the room, mm. rather than trying to develop some strategy to say stay, stay safe within that room, I can go into another room yeah. and find people that I do get on with, you know. And suddenly, you know, at some point I recognise, and I had to recognise, it doesn't matter what other people think of me. Yeah. And that doesn't have the same power over me anymore. As a kid, we are inevitably, in some degree, sometimes a lot, sometimes a small amount, victims mm. of the people around us. Yeah, and mostly as a kid, victims of the adults and their intent around us because they're the We're ones. We're sponges. That's why. Well, this is exactly right. We don't get to control our environment. You mm. know, if I didn't want to go to school, I couldn't just say to mum, "I'm not going in today, mum." <laughs> you know, the only way I would get to not go to school if I didn't want to go to school was to, in some way, do something to influence the decision of the person whose decision it was, yeah. which was my mum. Yeah. yeah, so this is why, you know, when, when it comes to school refusing, we might, that you might see children going into panic, mm. yeah, because a bit of their mind says, what's a strategy that will get the person who's deciding to change their mind for me, mm. yeah, and that might work. Yeah, it's not a conscious, deliberate thing, it's a subconscious response, it's a subconscious survival strategy, mm. okay. So I, I recognise that I don't need to make these people like me. No. When I go up to somebody now, if I'm in a room with people, I'm like, I'm okay with who I am. Yeah. Yeah. And it would be lovely if I found somebody who really liked me. Yeah. But it doesn't, it, it's not fundamental to my existence. No. It doesn't decide whether I like me or not anymore. No. And that's what I had to kind of work out. Yeah. Now, it, it makes it makes it sound like I had this revelation or something like the, the sun shone through the roof and, or something <laughs> like that. But this, I came to that realisation. The way I actually think I, I changed it mm. was I had to kind of, I had to, be kind to myself a little bit mm. because I'd been assuming I was rubbish <laughs> for a long time and it was comments like the one that my, my parents friends gave to my dad mm. after that party that made me think maybe I'm not as rubbish as I had judged myself in the past yeah and the three things that I did that I think I actually paid attention to for a while and then it started to become second nature for a start I decided I'm, I'm not ill mm. yet yeah, whenever I feel anxious it's not just for no reason I know I'm anxious about something. Yeah. Yeah. And and we could talk about, ask me after I've done these three, what about people who are anxious about nothing? Okay. Yeah. You're asking for, me to remember that. Yeah, I'm asking you to remember that. Anxious okay. for no reason, because it's something that I want to cover. Yeah. yeah? Um, the second thing, I wanted to listen to that part of me. Why was it anxious? So I might look at me getting anxious walking up to a group of people mm. and say, you know, I don't think I should be this anxious, but I needed to understand why I was then. Yeah. Yeah. And so understanding that that was a part of my mind that had developed a strategy from those years yeah. rather than one that was appropriate now mm. yeah and the third thing was I decided to be kind to myself mm. I'd done a lot of beating myself up in my time in terms of thinking I'm a failure or I wasn't good enough I decided that I wasn't going to do that anymore because if you beat yourself up you just end up beating thank you for that prompt I appreciate that you're welcome <laughs> I've only said it about a million times to you and I yeah. <laughs> Um, that I should have that T-shirt. To be fair, oh. if that was. Uh... But 
Tim, what about people who are anxious for no reason? I'm sure I'm so glad you've asked me that because that I feel to be fair, that is what a lot of people say. Yeah. When they if you if you look at the comments on my, my TED talk, a lot of them are what if we're anxious for no reason, what if we can't work out why we're anxious? Mm. In my experience, in the sort of 10, 11 years I've been working with people to help them with their anxiety, the, if we find ourselves anxious for no obvious reason, it tends to mean we've now become anxious about how anxious we are. Yeah, and you start then waking up doing a little progress report and it's like do I feel anxious it reminds me of that scene in the thick of it when someone's got to do something and I can't remember what it is and then I think it might be Malcolm Tucker he turns around he says how are you feeling anxious nervous worried and then (laughs) Ollie's like well I'm sure she was fine before you said anxious nervous worried (laughs) and it it reminds me of that it reminds me of that exactly this is the thing we when when anxiety is the thing that we're most concerned about we wake up and we do the little self audit, don't we? How yeah. anxious do I feel today? That's a really anxious thing to do. Yeah. I've been there, yeah. It's, I know it's... that I've, I've been guilty of that as well. But with you know, we may be framing it slightly more with with depression. If I had a bad day, I wake up the following day and the first thing I think is, how do I feel? Do I feel bad? Do I yeah. feel bad again? Am I having a bad day? Yeah. Rather than just, yeah. Why don't I just get up and see how I feel? You go looking for the feeling. Yeah. You go looking for it. You'll find it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like that that microscope where you put a speck of dust under it and you zoom in enough, it looks like a monster, yeah? <laughs> and and that's what happens. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it, it, the, the whole feeling anxious about feeling anxious, it's a real response. I used to run anxiety workshops, which if, if anyone in the profession thinking of doing it, don't bother, people don't turn up, they're too anxious, yeah? I, I learned that the hard way, yeah? Because what I would end up with mm. are texts or emails from people saying, so sorry, I'm not going to make it in today, Tim. Wouldn't you know it? my anxiety has flared up yeah, again? Yeah, yeah. As if it's like a rash, as if it's like something that unexpectedly landed on me that day. Yeah. When, when you think about it, I'm going to see this man I've never met before to sit in a group of people who are all feeling incredibly anxious who I've never met before I and mean, talk it, about my anxiety. It doesn't sound like a welcoming environment. I'm surprised you did any of them. It, it doesn't sound like a fun environment, does no. it? It sounds like the sort of thing that might cause you to feel anxious, yeah. in fact. But then, of course, if anxiety, if feeling anxious has simply become an indicator of your illness, then you will now feel like I'm having an ill day. Yeah. I'm having a, a bad day with my anxiety, so I better not go to that anxiety workshop. Mm. I th- I would I always said to people that did make it in, that's amazing that you've got here. Mm. Well done. That's the first. You know, you've done the hardest. The part. hardest part is showing up. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that always the way? And it's it so is with anxiety as well. Putting yourself in the situation that terrifies you mm. is is the hardest thing to do mm. because you do get to realise when you're there, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I remember somebody that came to one of these things and, and I remember her now, she was in the corner and I, I recognised myself in her. She was so kind of in the, in the breaks, she was kind of, you know, hiding away. Yeah. And throughout the, the course of the, the actual session we were running, she started to engage, she started to yeah. play hand, ask questions, things like that. And it was when I was with you a couple of years later, and this was now about four or five years ago, mm. and she came up to me when we were in the pub in Rochester right. and said you don't remember me do you and I was like I think I do but I'm not sure and she said you did I was so on this work and I remembered her when she prompted Aww. me and she said thanks to that I'm out here now with my friends mm. you know and, and it's that moment where you realize actually I can do this stuff mm. it wasn't you know the the feeling anxious wasn't the monster that I thought it was you're made of stronger stuff yeah and we just you've got to find that out sometimes haven't you mm. you know and, and I guess this is this is the thing that I, I want to talk to people about with anxiety. And, and I appreciate, I'm kind of more telling my story than actually doing a whole, you know, full sweep of anxiety now, because it is a, is a deep topic to go into. But the thing that I want people to know is that feeling anxious, that, that means you're human. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're ill. And if, you, if you're one of these people that have unfortunately been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, please remember what disorder actually means. It means a state of confusion. All that means is there is a state of confusion in your subconscious right now. Your, your mind is confused about what the appropriate emotional response would be. Mm. Not consciously. Yeah, consciously, you know, this. surely I shouldn't feel this way. Yeah. It's subconsciously. It's the bit that's in charge of your emotional responses. You're consciously just aware of how you feel. That's it. You're not necessarily controlling it or, or steering it. That part of you that creates that, that feeling is confused right now. 
mm. based on things that you've learned, based on stuff you've been through, based on stuff you've been told by people that you thought knew the, the score. Yeah? Mm. So if we feel anxious, you know, I say this in my TED talk, the only two people that don't feel anxious, dead people and psychopaths. <laughs> yeah. If you feel anxious, it means you're alive and there's a bit of you that cares enough about you to yeah. want to keep you safe yeah. and want to steer you towards happiness. Yeah. Um, also, and- we, we touched on this last week, but but don't underestimate the power that, that feeling tired and getting enough rest can, can be. I know personally when I start to feel anxious about things, it's, it's normally as well when I'm at a lower ebb, when, yes. I'm, when I'm a bit more run down as well. Well, there's a bit of you that looks at the challenge ahead of you mm. and says, yeah, I might have done that before, or mm. maybe I haven't, but I don't feel great right now. Yeah. The, the, the version of me that's taking this on. We've got to remember, we don't feel anxious about the thing. We mm. feel anxious about our perceived ability to deal with the thing. Yeah. Okay. And that, so it always comes down to our self-assessment at times. Um, and I think that's important to remember as well. Um, and here's the thing as well. The thing that probably is worth saying, just as a little kind of finishing thought, is that we are, well, the phrase living on an anxious planet <laughs> springs to mind yeah. because it's the thing I deal with most, not just because obviously my story means that I see more people to deal with anxiety. You know, I've written a book on it. I did a TED talk on it. But the reason I'm seeing mostly people for anxiety is because it's the biggest issue right now. Mm. Even before I would I put my story out there, more than half the people I was seeing in my practice were anxiety clients. Mm. Yeah, when When I was starting out 10, 12 years ago, I didn't see anyone for anxiety. Mm. They might be dealing with issues that we would now call and refer to as, oh, that's anxiety issue. But nobody sat down in that chair and said, can you help me with anxiety? No. Now, more than 50%. And to be fair, now that the talk's out there and everything, more than 75%. Yeah. And there is an argument put forward for this that is we haven't yet quite evolved to deal with the evolution of our technology. Yeah, so I recently read something or listened to a podcast i can't remember what it was but it was basically along the lines of our brains are still pretty much hardwired exactly the same as they were around henry the eighth's time <laughs> you know even even before that we haven't actually evolved in the brain that far well we can't this is evolution doesn't happen that quickly no technology mind speeds ahead yes. it would be literally like sitting Anne Boleyn down in front of a TV and trying to explain to her what is going on. <laughs> you know, it, it, she wouldn't be able to, to cope with it. Just because we've had these things most of our lives, mm. don't take for granted how different they are to our actual nature. Yes. You know, a, a dog or a cat can't use a phone because they've never had one. Just because we've actually had phones since we were kids. I mean, look at you yeah, and yeah. I, okay? So I am, unfortunately, a millennial. So <laughs> I am I am of the generation that I can remember before the internet, yeah. I can remember getting the internet, and I can remember now being plagued by the internet. You know, yeah. I've got the full spectrum. You've got Gen Zers who are younger than me, um, who think they can tell me I can't wear skinny jeans and side parts anymore. They can <laughs> go away. I've got enough to deal with, Gen Z. <laughs> um, but they have only known the internet. Yeah. And then you have, what are you? I'm, I'm Generation X. Generation X. Uh, why have I got millennial? And mine, mine doesn't sound as cool. Um, yeah, I think you get a bad rap. Yeah, millennial. I know. But you, but your your generation, if you will, you know, didn't have the internet for a really long time, and then now have quite a lot of technology. Well, okay, let's let's have an actual example here. Right? Yeah. So the modicum of bullying I got when I was at school. Yeah. As soon as I got off the bus and got home. Yeah. I was safe. I remember um, one Christmas I'd had a horrific time at school yeah. on the last day. And I was, I felt like I'd been at war, you know, <laughs> trying to deal with bullies. And I got home and my mum and dad, the, the fire was on, it was warm. Yeah. They were putting the Christmas decorations up. There was Christmas music on. And I just had this huge, I felt the tension <laughs> released from me you through every safe. pore of my being, you know. Mm. And I felt, that's great. Now I haven't got to worry about those people yeah. for another couple, few weeks now. Yeah. yeah. And, but and then, here's the thing, yeah. we can't do that now. No, but what I was going to say, and then you skip forward to, to even to, to me, yeah. and the the bullying that, that followed me home was on dial-up on MSN Messenger. Right. So if I 
didn't want to be around these people, yeah. guess what? I just didn't turn the computer on. Or yeah. if my mum was on the phone, yeah. I couldn't connect to the internet. If you're younger than me, ask your parents what that means. But I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't connect to the internet because my mum was on the phone. So I had relief from it. Yes, so you, you know? could put up the barriers yes. to it. Yes, yeah. and then by the time I got a smartphone and social media and everything, I was out of school. You yeah. know, I was, I was in my early 20s by the time I got yeah. on Facebook. But kids now... Yeah, their, their bullies are in their pockets. They can't stay away from it. Yeah, exactly, because everything we do is now on our phone. It's our yeah. lifeline, and unfortunately, that's where all of their all of our antagonists dwell, yeah. as well as our friends and our colleagues. We know? keep saying we're going to do an episode on social media, and I think this should come up soon because we do keep referring back to it. It feels yeah. like social media is is both a saviour and a cause of so many of our problems. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is why people can listen to us talking about this, mm. but at the same t- time, it's why people are struggling. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, And this is the thing I should say, is this is not to... I'm not saying this as a sort of wrap-up about anxiety so that we can all feel thoroughly depressed about how anxious we're all going to get. <laughs> I'm saying it because it means that feeling anxious in these times is probably a perfectly natural response to so much information coming in at once yeah. and us having to deal with so much overwhelm yeah, yeah is is the thing that is like the the shared common experience of being alive right now mm. the potential for overwhelm is huge especially when there just seems to be bad news on bad news on bad news precisely precisely because that's what that's what gets hits that's what gets yep. engagement you know so the thing we've got to remember is it's okay that this anxiety feeling is a natural feeling it doesn't mean I'm ill. Yeah. It doesn't mean I'm broken. Yeah. It means I'm trying to deal with too much right now. Yeah. So, and, and I think that's a, that's a positive message in, in my language because it means there's something I can do about where I put my focus, what I do with my attention, whether I engage or I disengage. You know? This is why people feel a lot better when they say, well, I'm, I've come off social media for a while. <laughs> yeah. Because now there wasn't all this antagonism coming in every moment of every day. Mm. And our brain wasn't asked to deal with so much information. Mm-hmm. On, on so many different topics and so many different opinions, you know. So I feel like... Would you say it's just about listening to yourself as well? It, it massively is, yeah. yeah. And, and don't confuse listening to yourself with listening to all those thoughts that you know are catastrophizing and, and aren't true and things like that. And although the voice saying you're not good enough and stuff like that, mm-hmm. just remember that your, your mind, if you like, your subconscious, if you like, will tell you all sorts of things to try and keep you safe, to try and stop you going into a situation that will cause you to have an unpleasant experience. It's looking out for you. It is. My mind would tell me, you're not cool enough to talk to them. Mm. Not because it wanted me to feel bad about myself, but it didn't want me to inadvertently wander into that group Mm. and then get bullied by them because I wasn't cool enough. Yeah. Mm. So it was it was warning me off as a protective, it was like a protective friend mm. rather than an enemy trying to make me feel bad. So listening to yourself is paramount, but it's almost like understanding when that part's telling you what it what it believes to be true rather than what you know is true. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 that's the thing I would say. So um I, I hope I hope we've we've got somewhere that feels like it's a positive conclusion, yeah. Because the thing, if I had to say the thing that I have to have everyone understand when I'm working with them for anxiety is that anxiety is not an indicator of illness. No matter how bad it becomes, it's an indicator of your mind showing concern for some aspect of your your existence Mm. and who you are and where you're going. If we can understand why that is, where it comes from even, you know, uh, I think it did help me to understand that, you know, there was certain trigger points for me, certain experiences my mum was trying to protect me from then we do get to change it. We get to update and upgrade our outlook and our, and our perception of what's going on out there. You know? Absolutely. I I feel with anxiety, is it is something we can talk about over and over again. And I do know that in all of the podcasts that we do, things like anxiety and depression kind of come back in yeah. and, and, you know, we have lots of different things for it. So I do hope, for me anyway, because I can remember obviously my, my foray with anxiety, it's that honestly... I'm not broken Mm. is probably the most important message here. It's that you're not broken. It's there for a reason and, and try and listen to it. Yeah. I've had so many people say to me of all the things, all the techniques people gave me, there was nothing that did more good for me than someone who knows what they're talking about saying, you're not ill. Mm. This is a natural response that you've got going on there. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I guess, I guess that for me is the light at the end of the tunnel. 
is realizing that there are things I can do to change the way I feel. And if I put my focus on me rather than outside all the things I can't control, then I've got a good chance of doing something about it. Yeah. And feeling differently, maybe. You know? oh, I think that is a lovely message to let people with. Well, thank you, Tim, for telling your story. I know you were a bit hesitant to do it, but I'm I'm really, really glad you did. And I think that it's something that people will get a lot from who have maybe felt in the same position or in the past or currently do so yeah well i hope hope it's been of help to people anyone that wants to do a bit of a deeper dive into this sort of stuff they can pick up my book which is called clear your head um and they can look at my tedx talk which is titled how to stop feeling anxious about anxiety yes and those two sort those two uh, resources may may give you a bit more detail of, of the way i think about it yeah i'd recommend my book but it's about how to start a cake business so which is just as good, if <laughs> if slightly unrelated. <laughs> I just wanted to plug my book, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening, guys. Um, as Thanks, always, guys. if you have enjoyed this, please do come tag us on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Brit Marie Box. You can find Tim on Instagram at Tim Box Mind Coach. And you can also find his YouTube, Tim Box Mind Coach, as well, I believe. Beautiful. You're getting very slick at the social media shout outs at the end. Thank you very much. So again, thanks for listening, guys. Make sure to do something nice for you today. Um, And until next time, we will see you later. Keep thinking outside the box. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Bye.